Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Yaniv. It's another beautiful Chazak event tonight, Bezrat Hashem. We chose uh, a topic that we all need to hear about. It's uh, peace in a family, Shlom Bayit. And uh, I see that most of the people here are uh, single. It's very good. It's better to know about it before you go into the trouble, not after. <laughs> once, you, once you're inside, it may be a little bit too late. It's like, the, like someone came to the Chafetz Chaim and asked him, uh, Rabbi, from what age we should start to be mechanic our son? So he told him 20 years ago. He was a kid, you know. Which means, first you had to start with yourself. After you mechanic yourself, then you have to worry about your children. Because the personal example, personal, <laughs> personal example is always the best chinuch. You can give beautiful lectures to your children if they see you live the opposite of what you preach for. But it's not, just not going to work. It's like going to a doctor who tried to convince you to quit smoking, how terrible it is for your health, and he's doing it while he's smoking one cigarette after the other. What's his chance to be successful, you know? It's not going to work. The statistic today, unfortunately, you know, every year it becomes worse than the previous year, that it used to be that the non-religious people have a very high rate of divorce, very high rate. It reached more than 70% in some areas, which means 70 out of 100 couples who got married having divorce within four years. And it's true that some people already divorced three or four times, so that brings up the statistic. But in a religious world, until 10, 15 years ago, it was very rare to find divorced couples, very rare. But today, the numbers are going higher and higher tremendously. It's mamash a serious problem now. What happened in a religious world that brings the statistic to become worse and worse every month? What happened? What is the key point that we can put our finger on and say, this is the main reason why every month there is more religious couples that get divorced than the previous month. Who, who thinks he knows the answer here? If you have to put your finger, there's obviously hundreds of things. What is the main reason that so many religious couples are becoming single again, they get divorced? Yes. Well, obviously, if they get divorced, they didn't have Shalom Bayit. But what's the main reason? Yeah. Ego. ego. You say ego, what do you say? Pride. Same thing. Yeah. Cheating. Well, cheating is not, cheating is not the root of the problem. It's a result of a problem. Lack of giving. No? Anyone? Money. Money. Oh. That's it. We're getting closer. Every answer make, brings us a little bit closer. The answer is... The answer is... Shh. The answer is one reason. We have less and less iras shamayim. Less and less fear from God. When a person has high level of fear, he understands life is not a picnic. I'm not a tourist here that came to enjoy the hotel and the room service. I have a mission here to achieve. And a part of it, a major part of my life is how I behave in my marriage. Then I invest a lot of my efforts to make the marriage work. Once a person has no irat shamayim, he allows himself to do anything he wants. More and more. Now, let me give you a story that I heard about, about maybe a week ago. A story like this, 12, 15 years ago, definitely wasn't possible to hear. It was very, very rare. Today, it's becoming, an, uh, a becoming a real epidemic. My friend 
is very connected to what's happening in a religious world and it gives me information, statistic about what's going on. Some of the statistic I use as parts of my lecture to wake the people up. He told me that there was a couple who went on a date. For instance, let's call them uh, Reuven and Sarah. Reuven and Sarah went on a date. And you can use those chairs if you want, there's some more chairs there. Yeah, Reuven and Sarah went on a date. And then, for whatever reason, the parents interfered and the parents did not let them get married. And this is a very common problem in our time, that the parents want to rule our life and they want us to do what's good for them, not what's good for us. And we are falling into this trap because we either not educated in Torah, we don't know what needs to be done, what's not, we don't have that Torah, we don't have a rabbi to advise us what to do. We, we use our heart and not our head to think. And when you think with your heart, you ended up messing up your life just because you wanted to satisfy someone else. And you didn't know that the rule in the Torah that your life comes before your parents' life. Your life comes first. Even your best friend, your life is first. Your brother, your life is first. Every, no matter what, your life is first. Chayech HaKodmim, that's the rule in Judaism. You have to first worry about your own life, and then everyone else comes next. So, Reuven and Sarah wanted to get married. The parents messed it up. They got separated, and they went on with their life. Later, Reuven met a girl. Sarah met another guy. They got married. Both of them have one kid. One day, they meet in a store after a few years from their separation. They meet in a store. This is a true story that happened recently. We're talking in the last month or two. They meet in a store, and you know, right away, old feelings came back to their life, and uh, they begin to talk about their life, and one thing leads to another. Reuven didn't know that the halacha says that uh, you have to stay away from conversation with women because one thing leads to another. And he talks and talks, and then in the end, they decided to be in touch. They decided that they want to be in touch. Married woman and a married guy. They decided they want to be in touch. And after a few days that they've been talking to each other, they decided that they want to get back together. However, it's a problem now, you know, because they're both married. She has to get a get first. So they say, before we waste our time getting divorced, let's see if it's going to work between us. Let's go together on a trip. One week we'll be together, and we go on a trip, and if everything will work out, and we know it's the right, the right one, then we'll get divorced. So he comes to his wife and he said, there is a special seminar in Israel, you know, to elevate your Irat Shamaim. It's not funny, it's very sad, the story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, he, wants, he tells his wife, there is such a seminar to, you know, of Irat Shamaim, one week, to work on our midot, so I'm going to Eretz Israel. The wife was happy, maybe something will come out of it, you know. And the girl came to her husband and she said, my uncle, I know you never heard of him because he's a faraway uncle for mine. He's dying any minute. And a rumor came to me that a part of his will, it's me. I'm supposed to get some, you know, money. And obviously, obviously, I want uh, to show my face before, you know, to tell him thank you. And he's in a hospital in Israel. So I want to go on a week to Israel, and then, you know, I'll come back in a week. The problem was that Sarah's husband wasn't a fool like Reuven's wife. He said, okay, darling, go. Right away, he called a private investigator in Israel, and he gave him the date of the flight, and he described, he sent him with a computer a picture of his wife. He said, as soon as she comes out from the airport, attach yourself to her all week. Don't leave her a second. Film her, take pictures of her, everything. She arrived to Israel. Who was waiting for her? 
this guy Reuven, he arrived in a, or together with her, or in a different flight, I don't know. So they come out from the airport, and the detective is filming. I don't have to tell you what happened that week. It definitely didn't work on Irat Shamaim, let's put it that way. And when she came back to America, she showed up in her apartment, and she found an empty apartment and hundreds of pictures of her and the other guy on the walls, all over. This is what happened. Obviously now, she lost her husband. Who knows the future of her kids? He lost his wife. This is what happened right now. Something like this, 40, 50 years ago, even by the Goim, you didn't have. Even the Goim had decency not to become worse than animals. That's the problem. When a person has no fear from God, there's no limit to how monster he can become. A person can become the worst monster on earth. Why? There's no irat shamayim. When you live with the motto, do whatever you want as long as you don't get caught by the police, by people, by neighbors, by your parents, by anyone, so the idea is just not to get caught. It's easy to cheat people here. Most of the time you don't get caught. Most murderers don't get caught. Most thieves do not get caught. Not even 1% of the thieves are brought to justice. Most of the cases the police don't even bother to search for the thief. What? You think you have time for every time a person broke into a car, they have time to go and search for him? They don't even waste time. They laugh in your face. Why did you waste your time to come fill up a report? That's what's happening today. Most cases, they don't care. They don't even start. Why? The chance to, to bring the person to justice is almost zero. Or it doesn't pay for them. It's going to cost too much money. The Torah already warned us from all these desires that can bring our life to a total destruction. This is what the Torah has to say. Let me read to you some of the important things that the holy books have been talking about in the last 3,000 years. And this is what it is. The Torah says like this. It's been a rule always that the holiness of the nation of Israel started with the foundation of everything. What is it? Modesty. The modesty of the house, the modesty of the wife, the modesty of the husband. That the nation of Israel are well known to be separated, to be higher than all the other nations when it comes to modesty. That the marriage in a Jewish family, it's a holy ceremony, it's a holy institution. And it makes their entire life holy. From the minute they went into the chuppah, and now every second that they live with, with marriage, it's all a holy thing. Lachen amru chachamim, therefore the sages said, that a husband and a wife, in the time of their marriage, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is giving them an opportunity to make a total repentance for the entire past. Whether they are 20, whether they are 30, they have an opportunity, it's a, it becomes a greater day than Yom Kippur for them. Because they have an opportunity to start their life clean. Of course, we are talking about people who got married according to the laws of the Torah. We're not talking about people who had five different bands and dancers dancing in front of all the audience here. And the boys and girls are all mingled together. That's Sodom and Gomorrah, that's not a wedding. It's better for a person to stay single all his life than to marry in a mixed wedding. The amount of sins that he accumulates in the first night of his life with his wife, it's so big that I wonder if he's ever going to be able to correct it in his entire life. Four or five hundred people are making sins, eating, no bracha, mixing, touching each other, looking at each other, <coughs> mixing together. No holiness. HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't come to the wedding. Wedding like this, 99% of them ended up with destruction. There's no doubt about that. You can see, check the statistic. See how many of these mixed weddings are successful in the end. And don't come to me and say, hey, I know this couple that got married in this kind of wedding and they're still married. 
put a private detective in their house, see how they married. You know? Bill Clinton and his wife also married. <laughs> Bibi and his wife also married. There are many married couples. For the protocol, they are married. Every other week, there's a tape, there's a videotape. You have no idea what's going on. Sometimes it doesn't pay to get divorced. If you're a multimillionaire, you're too stingy to give up 50% of your wealth. So you have an open marriage. And that's what's going on today. So, the sage says that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave the Chatan and the Kala an opportunity to start clean. Why? Why HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave an opportunity to make a repentance in the day of the wedding? That's why many people fast. You know, they come... You see, when they go into the chuppah, the kala is reading Tehillim, the chatan is making a prayer, everything, they try to do it as holy as possible. Why? It's a very special day. Why it was so important for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to give an opportunity, such a nice bonus, that in the night of the wedding it will combine a total repentance? What's the connection? The answer is, because life is full of challenges. Full of challenges. Sicknesses problems with the kids, problems, all kinds of things. If they won't have to start clean, if they won't have the opportunity to start clean, every tragedy that happens in their mutual life in the future, they'll blame each other. It's all because of your sin. It's all because of your sins. It's because of your boyfriend you used to have. It's because of your father. It's because of this. It's because of what you did. It's because of your business. And there's never going to be an end to it. Like this, they come, they have an opportunity to start clean if they make a real kosher wedding according to Hashem's will. And right after that, there's blessing for the rest of their life. Then, Tzivu Chachamim, our sages order us that a person has to respect his wife more than his body. If you have uh, one pair of shoes, only for you or for her, you give it to her. Anything that it comes to body, she comes first. And love her just like you love yourself. Not more, but not less. Just when you, whatever you would do for yourself, you do for her. Whatever you'll never dare to do to yourself, you never dare to do to her. If he's very wealthy, he has to give her from his wealth and not being tight and stingy. Won't be too tough with her, won't put fear on her in her life, speak to her in a nice way, never with anger. That's the key to succeed as the husband's point of view. If he wants his marriage to be successful, this is it. Because when the wife knows her husband makes a million and he gives her $250 a week allowance, right away the marriage is not good. Because right away in her mind, she's, my husband is putting me as a, as a puppet, like a cleaning lady. Cleaning lady also get $250 a week <laughs> to watch the kids or whatever, the au pair. What kind of marriage is that? If the husband is poor, then, then she understands. He wish he can do, but he can't. But if he's very successful, she doesn't even know what he has. Many husbands that I know, keeping Shabbat, they make sure that their wife know anything they have, not their businesses, nothing is on her name. They're already in the time of the wedding, already preparing the day of the divorce. And because of that, they get divorced. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, you get what you deserve, my friend. You stay lonely. Why? Because if this is the way you come into the wedding, you're an egoistic person. You don't deserve to be married. He takes, her, he takes him away from her and gives her to a better person. What got him to divorce? He's worried about his millions. I'll give her money, I'll, I'll die and I won't give her a penny. This is how we start before they got married. Today they have a better way. It's called prenuptial agreement. <laughs> and the time of the, of the engagement, he already tells her how much you worth for me. 50 bucks in the time of the, way, of the divorce. And then you wonder why the marriage looked like that. So the Chachamim says like this, the woman has to respect her husband very much. Look up to him. Follow his advice. He would look to her like a minister or a king. 
The more she does it, the better the marriage will become. Today it's a problem. Some women, they want to be the boss in a house. So Rabbi, this is America and this is the 21st century. It's not like it used to be in our grandparents' generation that my grandmother was making challahs in a kitchen and she didn't know what to do. Right now, you know, I'm making money. I drive, I have my cell phone, I go on business trips. What makes my husband my boss or my king? He should give me respect. He should bow down to me. I make more money than him. That's called feminism. No problem. You be a feminist, but you be divorced. There's a price for everything. You want to do it your way, or you want to do it the Torah's way? That's the question here. Then, a person has to show his wife that he cares about her. If he saw her doing something not so modest, the way she dressed, or she talked to someone, or even the way she talks on the phone to people, he has to show that he cares. He has to care. If he doesn't care, what kind of love is this? What kind of a normal person allow his wife, for instance, to take a business trip with another man? But, but Rabbi, he works with her, he's a colleague. They work in the same office. But you're not normal. Who cares about her work? She goes on a plane, sitting next to him, spending three, four days with him. What, what, what kind of marriage is this? What kind of a kosher woman would agree for such a thing? Ah, she wants to make money? Okay, money, uh, making money in a not kosher way has a very serious price in your personal life. No, so, and a person, a person is jealous with what his wife does if he's, if he's pure in his thinking. Pure thinking means you're jealous to your wife. If you don't care about what she does, that means you are fully, deeply in impurity. It's not, it doesn't make sense that you see your wife is mingling with other people and it doesn't bother you. Most of this relationship between husband and wife, that the husband doesn't care who his wife talking to and who she's taking a ride with, that shows you that this marriage is completely dead. It's roommates. Of course, if I live with a roommate, I don't care who she takes a ride with. A roommate, it's not a wife. There's a difference between wife and roommate. I knew a couple, they already divorced now, but before they got divorced, they had two separate bank accounts. Her bank account and his bank account. And they shared the expenses of the family and they decided, you pay for this and I pay for that. If this is not roommate, what else is roommate? That's how roommates live. You pay for this, you pay for the electric, I pay half of this, you pay half of this. This is the relationship. No wonder why they divorce. Then, a person should never force his wife. Never force her to do things. Everything with nice talking, with convincing, in a, in a pleasant way. Even when he wants to be together with her in intimacy, I want to be together, and she's not in a mood for him. No matter what, he cannot force. Why? If a person forces his wife to have relation, and then she becomes pregnant in that night, there is no blessing in the life of these children. Very bad. The children, who knows, criminals, problems, you know. Many other things that I don't even want to say here. The Chachamim order the wife to be modest, not only on the street, also inside her house. Not to joke. Not to speak, not modest, even to her husband. Well, she's influenced from all the commercials and the movies that she watch here and there, while she's working on a computer, or while she's going to the gym, she watch television over there. Rabbi, it's only women. But the two hours that she's there, she watch all the filth, and eventually it goes into her veins and affecting her life, because she see how they talk, they go in. And she begins to talk like this. And then she imitates the way they dress, and the way they live, and then she sits in a coffee shop, and here and there, and everyone who pass by the street see this respectable religious woman, how she live, she thinks she's an actress in Hollywood. A woman should always be available to her husband. 
she tried to do everything she can to be available because automatically it would save him from sinning somewhere else. It's a part of her obligation when she comes into the wedding. When they get married, we make an agreement, Ktuba. Ktuba is an important agreement. What's the obligations of a man? Provide money. Huh? Provide money. Provide money. What else? Clothing. Shelter. Shelter. What else? Attention. Relationship. Provide his wife intimate relation. If not, there's a problem in the agreement. You're not fulfilling your obligation. And a woman, of course, she has her own obligation. The Torah says, when if you do it in the right way, the spirit, the Shekhinah of Hashem is in your life, in your house, in your marriage. Ish, I'm sure you heard it many times, but I'm going to tell you something perhaps you didn't hear. Ish has Yud in it. Aleph, Yud, Shin. You take the Yud out. Isha has A in it. You take the He out. It's the name of Hashem. Ya. Vanachnu nevarech Ya. If you take the Yud from the Ish and you take the He from the woman, what do, you be, what do you have? Ash and ash. Fire and fire. All day disrespect, cursing, anger, problems, gossip, etc., etc. When a person gives Ktuba to his wife, the Chachamim ask, why the name of it is Ktuba and not Ktav? If you know Hebrew, the proper word for it, it's Ktav. Ktav, it's something in writing. What does it mean Ktuba? Where this word came from? It's not a legitimate word in the in a holy language. What's ktuba? The Chachamim said, if Hashem is not in your life, in your marriage, in everyday life, there's no irat shamayim, the presence of Hashem, you don't feel it in every minute of your life, then you, it becomes ash and ash. But the name of Hashem, it's not only you and hey. The name of Hashem is Yud, Hey, Vav, and Hey. Where is the Vav and the Hey? Right? You take the Yud out of the Ish, you take the Vav, uh, you take the Hey out of the Isha, you're still missing Vav and Hey. They add the Vav and the Hey to the word Ktab, and it became Ktuba. Ktab, take Vav and Hey, add it, it became Ktuba. So now you have Yud and Hey in the name of Ish and Isha, the Ktuba in between them. Has the Vav and the He, Yud, He, Vav and He. That's the name of Hashem. This is the secret why it became Ketubah. And this is an agreement. It's a valid agreement. If a person violates this agreement, he has a serious problem. So, what is it considered to be a Jewish religion when it comes to husband and wife? The Torah said that if a woman violates the Jewish religion, over it al dat yehudit, she loses her rights in the wedding. Which means, if the husband has to divorce her and he wrote ten million dollar in her ktuba, she lost it. If they go to Beidin, she she brings out her ktuba and say he wrote to me with two witnesses that if he ever divorces me, he'll pay me ten million dollar. That's the agreement. I want the money. The husband come out, he brings two witnesses to testify that she violated that he did. She go out of the marriage with nothing except one outfit to wear. That's it. She lost all her rights. She lost half of the house. She lost whatever. He has a thousand buildings. She lost everything. For violation of that he did. When it comes to modesty, there's no discounts. Akadosh Baruch Hu is very, very strict with a woman if she's not modest. Very, very strict. So what is it? Let's read. Going out to the public territory or to the backyard in her neighborhood. Even to the backyard of his neighbor, of her neighborhood. Not completely to the street. Without covering her hair. She goes out and her hair is not covered and every man on the street can see her hair, and even though she's a married woman. Or her clothing is not modest. Or she put flowers here to attract attention from people on the street. Or all kinds of 
extra things to attract attention. And two witnesses came to the bed in and say, we saw that woman and that particular day that that's how she walked in the street. And that second, she lost all her eyes. Do you understand what we're talking here about? The halacha never changed. The women today, they're not aware of it. Why? Because the rabbis are afraid to tell them the truth. But that's one of the main reasons why marriages are not successful, because the, women's, the women are not modest. They are not modest. The men has plenty of their own problems, but the foundation of the house is modesty. If you see a woman that all she cares about is to show her beauty and her body on the street, how did you agree to marry such a woman? Because she's Shomer Shabbos, it's not enough. For wedding, it's not enough. For other things, maybe yes. But for wedding, it's not enough. If you marry a woman that you see right away in a dating, that all she cares about is tons of colors all over herself. Pink, red, this, purple, like this, tons of spray, tons of perfume, very high heels, go on the street, she cannot walk, you know, <laughs> like this. She try to get up, she's stuck, she can Why? The skirt is so tight. What was the reason you married her? Don't you understand that in two months from now your, your life will be buried? If you see a man that in the middle of the date, every girl he walks by, he turns around, why did you marry him? Don't you see that he's in the field? He has a lot to work on himself before he will be worthy to become a husband. A person that every woman that walks on the street, he looks at her, what kind of husband he can be? Right away, before you even got married, he has 5,000 wives with you together. you the official one, and he has another 5,000. Everyone walks in the street. He's the second wife with his thinking in his dirty mind. Rabbi, but he went to the best yeshiva. So what? So what, what, what's the answer? I don't understand. Just because he was three years ago in a good yeshivot, I remember one time, one of, the, one of the important Jewish people in the business world, very famous family, very wealthy family, I made a Shabbaton in their house. They bring tons of people. It's mamash like a very big event every Shabbat in their house. And they have a son. And the father of the son asked me to find his, his, his son a shidduch. A nice girl, he gives me the request that they're looking for, this and this and that. And I say, okay, I actually know a girl that may, may be good enough for him. But I told him, I want you to send your son to me. I want to talk to him in private. I want to, I want to get information about him before I send him up. So he comes to my house one night. He comes to me, fine. He's working in his father's empire. And I ask him about his history. He gives me the name of the best yeshivot that you, it's possible. The best yeshivot. He learned in the best yeshivot. Yeshivot that is very hard to get in. You cannot be a moron and get accepted to this yeshivot. You have to be somebody knowledgeable. One thing I didn't know at that time, that money buys everything. Everything. If your father wants to buy the yeshiva, he buys it. And he puts you in. If he wants you to be the Rosh Yeshiva, you add another million, you become the Rosh Yeshiva, even though you don't know how to read Rashi. <coughs> Everything is possible in this corrupted world. And that's what I didn't know yet. They say it in Hebrew, Ubal Ameah, Ubal Adea. The owner of the hundred is the owner of the opinions. That's what happened. So I set him up with a date with this girl. Now this girl told me, I want someone who is Ben Torah. He goes to good yeshivot, he knows a lot of Torah. I don't care about anything else besides Torah. I said, well, now when he told me that he went to the best yeshivot, he has to know a lot of Torah. How can you be 10, 20 years in yeshivot and not know any Torah? The next day this girl called me. She blasted me on the phone like never before. That was my Yom Kippur. She gave me a good Mozart talk. 20 minutes, in a nice way, but believe me, it was a, a sore to the heart. What do you think I am? Do you think because he's a billionaire I'm going to take him? It was the worst date I ever had. He couldn't say two sentences of Torah, this guy. I sat there, all I heard about is his businesses, what they buy, what they sell, what they're going to do next year. 
she dumped him out, she didn't want to hear from him anymore. You understand? She was clever. Most girls will fall into the trap. We see a $300,000 car, a mansion is waiting for her, diamonds every birthday, 10 carats, five maids. She won't have to check the ladders. Rabbi, Amiga will do it for me. But that's not what marriage is all about. That's not marriage. No, no, no. Marriage has to have love and spirituality in it. Today, many people get married because of what they're going to get from their spouse. Guys and girls. Guys and girls. You know that? That's what's going on. So, let's continue to read. A woman that walks not modest to the street, she doesn't lose her rights right away before she gets a warning. They tell her, we saw you walking without covering your hair on the street. If it happened one more time, you lost all your rights. And then if she got caught twice, she lost all her rights. The Ben Ishchai, the very holy Rav about a hundred years ago in Iraq, the Ben Ishchai writes like this. If a person make a fight with his wife because of something that they did in the house, why didn't you pay the mortgage? We're going to have a late fee now. Okay, she forgot. She has a lot of pressure. He begins to scream in front of the guest, embarrass her, who knows what. So, the Ben Ishai writes, Someone who has a brain inside his head has to know that whatever, hap whatever happened to his wife, an accident that happened with his wife, it's really not her fault. It's a test that Akadosh Baruch Hu puts in his life to see if he's going to pass that test or not. And the Satan is standing, celebrating, when he loses temper and begins to attack, and you know what's happened next. Who could ever win against the Satan? So when a person sees that his wife is not functioning 100% in all the needs in the house, he should never ever get angry at her. Everything in a nice conversation, you know, you don't pay attention to this, but in a nice way. Oh, it's once enough, he scream once, he, once he lose all the blessing in his life. A person who is angry, once we made a whole lecture about anger here. A person that is angry is equal to a person who worship an idol. If you see a Jew with a nice beard, keeping Shabbat, giving tzedakah, learning Torah, but he's angry, he has no patience, every little thing he scream, oh, again, and he makes faces, and he has an attitude, is equal to this Chinese that bow down to Buddha and kiss his legs every morning. Equal in a Torah. How can it be, Rabbi, you compare this tzaddik, he's keeping Shabbat and learning Marat two hours every morning, you compare him to this Chinese that goes down to the Buddha or this Indian that bow down to the cow? I did not compare. The Torah says, Areu ke oved avodah zara. 100% like an idol worshiper. A person has to be down to earth in his house. Rabbi, Amar Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi. Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi is one of the ten people in history that went to heaven with their body. Which means he sanctified his body to become like a part of the soul. Only ten people in history had that merit. He's one of them. This is what he says. You don't want to listen to me, listen to him. He says like this. A person has to be down to earth in his house. Why? If his wife give him musar, you don't get up in the morning, you're not praying, you're not doing this, you don't give enough tzedakah, your kippah is the third quarter, maybe it's about time you make it bigger. Maybe you have a haircut and look like a normal person instead of all this blorit. It gets him angry. Who are you to tell me what to do? That's most of the people. Look at yourself before you tell me. That's not the right answer. What's the right answer? Thank you, Hashem, for sending me the messages through the most important person in my life. Better it comes from her than it comes from uh, someone in the street. Embarrass me, no? If she doesn't tell him, she becomes a part of his sins. Rabbi, I have a problem with my husband. What's the problem? Every morning he gets up at 11 in the morning. How long it's been going on? Three years. 
Where were you until now? I didn't know, I don't, I don't know, I didn't want to get into a fight with him. Most of the fights between a husband and a wife is always somehow connected to money. How much are you wasting? Why do you have to buy the best shoes? You have 300 pairs of shoes. Why did you, how many times I told you don't park over there? You know, it's all about money. When she buys 300 pairs of shoes, should he accept it as a Nisayon? <laughs> One of the things you have to do before you get married is to check the closet of your future wife. Because <laughs> most women have this weakness, these shoes. I don't know why. Women are crazy about shoes. <laughs> if you find one wife that doesn't have 300 pairs of shoes, only 20, then it's fine. <laughs> the Torah say, there used to be a rabbi, his name is Rabbi Ada. Rav Ada, he, lo he lived a very long life. The Torah say, what was his merit that he lived such a long life? The answer, he never got angry at his house, at his wife or the children. He always was down to earth. You never heard anyone was afraid of him. The Torah say, in your house, be a vatran. Give up. Don't be too picky. Every little thing, it's an argument. Why you make the steak well done? I told you I don't like it like this. Or if you come from, from work, and the dinner is not ready. Oh, poor wife. What about your wife? She was also working out of the house. Rabbi, in our tradition, the wife has to make dinner when I come home. That's, everybody knows in our community. Your community is a peel of the garlic compared to the Torah. One letter in the Torah is better than the entire stupid community. Who do you think you make the rules of God? What comes first? The, the, the stupid uh, culture that you brought from some Muslim country and become like these Arabs that beat up their wife? This is the way of the Torah? No, that's not what Hashem say. You don't have dinner, you eat pretzels with hummus, like I do. <laughs> <laughs> have dinner, I don't have dinner. What is this? <laughs> Rabbi, but my father told me, make sure your wife makes for you steaks every, mo every evening. <laughs> it used to be that our mothers and grandmothers, they used to be home all day. They have a donkey, they make, they, they have a bre they make bread, they, can, they make pita bread. Life is different now. Now the wife lives in the morning, she goes to work, she's a teacher, she's a therapist, she's, she works. She has a lot of things on her mind. On top of it to raise children, on top of it to cook, come on, eat what you have. What's, I hope today you can buy everything ready, salad here, salad there, bread, you put in, some cold cuts, you have dinner. Two minutes to make dinner. Who cares? Ah, you care about these things? You put yourself in a level like the animals. You see how the animals, when they see meat, how their tail is moving? <laughs> like this? Look at the, at the squirrel, how they come to the garbage. Every Motzei Shabbos. They know they're going to have a lot of things there. <sighs> One of the job of the wife is to really, to really be a therapist to her husband. A real therapist, a psychologist. Why? Usually man comes home, he has stress from work, he had a hard day in the office, here, there, or learning all day. His mind is full of things. Now, all he needs is that the wife will add a little oil to the fire and it's going to be an atomic bomb. A kosher wife, she has to settle him, sit, relax, here is, you know, eat something, drink, let's drink together, relax, it doesn't worth it. To calm him down, that's a part of her mission in life and give him a lot of attention. She has to be the most beautiful wife when he comes home, not when she goes to buy grocery by Jose and Vini <laughs> and Tony. Jose, como esta? 
the Rebitzen of town. Well, the husband come home, like this, that. What happened? I had a tough day with the kids. Two hours ago when she went to shop, the bothering of the kid didn't bother her so much. She put 20 minutes to show. Why? To go to the store to buy milk. <laughs> Everything against the Torah. Everything. One of the main problems, as someone here say, the addiction to material. People becoming more and more and more materialistic every month. It's a, it's a sickness. It's a mental disease. There is no end to it. The more you're hungry for it, you become more and more hungry. It never ever fills you up. You eat food, that's it. You cannot breathe anymore. <laughs> Rabbi, what happened? Three days I cannot eat. Why? You know, that's it. I ate so much. I can't eat. You pay me a million dollars, I can eat. What do you want me to die? To choke? Every desire has on and off. Even a, a person is addicted to a woman. He makes a scene with her. Then he has three, four hours that he cannot look at her. Then he makes the scene again. Then again, it's on and off. Food. You eat, eat, eat. That's it. You choke. Now you need eight hours rest. And then you eat, eat, eat again. And then you need rest. Money, there is no time out. This desire doesn't stop for one second and bury you and more and more and of course ruins your marriage and your children and everything. You see today religious kids walk with $300 in the pocket to kindergarten, <laughs> to elementary school. All kinds of electronic device, five, 400, 500, this pad, that pad, this pad, too many pads out there. <laughs> And then they wonder, Rabbi, I don't know why my son has problems in learning. Why do you expect him to open a Gemara? It's the most boring thing for him in the world after he sees all this noise and color and music. Rabbi, I have computer for the house, but it's only for my wife. What do you think? The wife is not a human being? No, but she's a woman. She's allowed to watch. She said that she's very bored at home. She has a baby. You know, she, she's in the house. It's destroy her spiritually just as much as it's destroy you. You have to understand the nature of a person when he sees all kinds of fleshy things, he wants it. And then he compares what he has at home, and it's not exactly like in a movie, and then he doesn't want anything else in his life. That's it. The marriage is destroyed, cheating begins. That's what's happening today. In Israel, they put a big sign in a highway. You read 60? Come replace your wife with a young Russian girl. They show a picture of a prostitution house there. Every corner in Israel they have this. They brought 800,000 Russian, half of them goyim or prostitutes. They filled up Israel with prostitution homes. All these goyot misera amalek, they have no mercy. They destroy one family after the other. One Israeli electrician one Israeli electrician, he had a job in Eilat. You know Eilat? It's all the way in the south. He went there, it became Friday evening. He has to continue his job on Sunday morning. Shabbat, they don't work. The hotel has like a weekend and everything. So he called up his wife. He said, listen, if I'm going to take now a car to come back to Tel Aviv, and then I have to go back to Elat. That's my whole Shabbat. You know, it's four hours to get there, four hours to come back. What's the point? Why don't I just stay here for Shabbat in a hotel? They're giving me a room here. I'll finish my job Sunday, and I'll come Sunday night. The wife, she didn't suspect anything. Okay. That's a true story that happened in Israel about 10 to 15 years ago. So... He sits in a, in a hotel Friday night. He's not a religious guy. When a non-religious guy sits in a quiet hotel room at 9, 10 o'clock at night on Friday night, he went down to the lobby, hotel, boring. He didn't find what he wants. He goes back to his room. What did he do? He looked in the yellow pages there. They have a, a guide of the hotel. Then he found the prostitution services. So he called up the number. 
and they say, yes, sir. So send me a girl to this hotel, to that room. He's waiting for the girl. After an hour, he comes, fix his hair, perfume, open the door. Who did he see? His daughter, the student. True story. That's only the beginning of the story. He started to scream, to cry. While his blood pressure went up, he got a heart attack and died. That happened in Israel. It should have been enough to every normal person, that story, to stop with this phony lifestyle. People continue. I know there is a big epidemic even here in the religious community that husbands are cheating on their wives. It's hard to believe how a person that knows Hashem, he already gets up to Shachrit, he comes, he prays, he puts tefillin, he keeps Shabbat, and he cheats on his wife. Isn't Judaism is all about being a grateful person? Well, how can it be? It's like hard to believe how can something like this happen? How a person can become so dirty that the woman who takes care of him, cook for him, do his laundry, raise his children, takes care of all his needs, in the end, the thank you she gets from him, that he goes to some kind of uh, animal, goya somewhere, and makes sins with her and return home at 2 or 3 o'clock at night. Every day with another excuse. I lost my phone, it fell in the water, I was here, my uncle got a heart attack. Every day he comes with another lie. He doesn't even care she knows where he is, but he won't admit it. Hard to believe. This is all come from no irat shamayim. If a person has no irat shamayim, he can become just like Eichmann and Hitler, no different whatsoever. No difference. I'm telling you, there's no limit how a person can drown. The only thing can take you out from collapsing is Torah and Musar. Not only Torah. If you only learn Gemara, it won't be enough. You gotta learn Musar, Musar. You have to see where you're heading when you finish your ears here. If a person see what is, thank you, what is the punishment of being a cheater to his own wife and not fulfilling his obligation as he signed in a Ketuba. If he see for every hour of pleasure supposedly that he had here, how many years he's gonna have to be tortured for this hour? Who would be a fool? to buy an hour of pleasure for 1,000 years of suffering. Who? If a person would see how strict are the punishment of Hashem for all this cheating. I'm not even talking about women who cheat. That's 10 times worse, because there's no recovery from it. If a man cheated, if the wife agreed to forgive him, they're allowed to be together. If it's up to her. You want to accept him back or not? If a woman cheated, finished. That's it. The marriage is an old. Not allowed to touch her. Very serious problem here. And wh what happened? Women are cheating, and then the husband doesn't know. They go back together, and then they have children. But every moment of their marriage is a sin now. They're not supposed to be together. And then she has a kid, and another kid, and 20 years later, this kid is the biggest drug dealer and is molesting people. And he's doing all kinds of things, and the husband is wondering, how can it happen to me? I really, I'm religious, I did this, I gave tzedakah, I did this. What, how, how can it be that I have such children? The wife never told him the truth. Now they're both suffering. He lost from both sides. From both sides. You know what happened? There was one, uh, one Jew that wanted to marry a Goya. And his mother was begging him not to do it to the family, but he's egoistic. They only care about themselves. After everything she tried to do, it didn't work, she took him to one of the Rebbe, one Admor, one important Rav. She took him to the Rav. The Rav is begging him to leave the Goya, it doesn't help. In the end, the Rabbi told him a story that finally saved him. He told him, when I was in the camps, we were standing on line to the gas chambers. And I had a Jew in front of me that didn't stop crying. He was going, he was like panicking, going crazy, crying, pulling his hair. I said to him, what kind of a person you are? You don't know that we go from here to heaven? What's in this world that you're so upset to die? Just accept it like a hero. Say Shema Israel, and that's it. That's it. We finish our job here. No, Rabbi, it's not this. I'm not crying for dying. I'm happy that I'm going to die now. You know why I'm crying? 
You see that woman with the baby over there? Yeah, this is my wife, a German Goya. Twenty years ago, when I was about to marry her, my father went on his knees begging me, don't do it to us, don't do it to us. I didn't care. I married her, I broke my father's heart, my father died, my mother became mentally ill. I destroyed my family. I ruined the shiduchim for my brothers, everything. And now she called the Nazis to tell them where I'm hiding. Not only she buried me in the next life, I lost everything. Even in this life, I lost everything. She took my house, everything, my business, and now I'm standing on line to the gas chambers. You understand why I'm crying? And that saved the boy. The boy started to think. We had a case like this in Israel, one modern orthodox. Modern orthodox is a very, very scary word. In a clear language, it means I am orthodox according to my convenience. What I like to do, I do. What I don't like to do, I pretend I don't know. To sit in a theater, no, don't worry, I put a baseball hat. The scene is changed, still destroying your soul. Why you do this, why you do that, everything they have an answer for. There's nothing like this half, or modern, or it's either Omer Mitzvot or Yunah, that's it. There's no in between. So one guy, Shomer Shabbat, he met a volunteer from England, a Goya, Elizabeth from London, came to Israel to the kibbutz. And this modern orthodox with his kippah is the size of a quarter, fell in love with her. You know, in a the kitchen, they met in a kibbutz. Fell in love with her. Few months they dating, all his friends are telling him, Avi, Avi, your eternity is on the line here. Why do you want to marry a non-Jew? The Torah is so strict about it. You cut your entire descendants. The tree of all the generations, you are cunning. You're punishing all your fathers and grand-grand-grandfathers. What's going on with you? He said, I can't help it. It's my heart. You don't understand. I can't control it. Today they found a way. They, she made a kishuf on me. Kishuf. Magic, black magic, spell, something. I don't know what she did to me. She took away my heart. Hashem will understand me. I don't really want to do it. They do everything they can to convince him not to fly to the wedding in a church. The wedding is in a church in London. 500 people are invited to his wedding. Nothing helped. Tomorrow is his flight. Two days from now he's getting married. They told him, listen, we did everything we can to prevent you from getting married to this Goya. You don't listen to us? Fine. Let's make Lechaim. No, what do you want? We have to respect your decision. You want to get married? Come, we have a gift for you. He said, wow, I'm happy that you finally understand me. No problem. On my way to the airport, I stop by. On the way to his airport, he comes, his friends bringing him in. He said, Avi, we, brought, we have champagne. They're opening the, the bottle of the champagne. Before he realized, one of the guys pushed him into the room and locked the door. <laughs> He said, come on, is this a joke? Open the door. He said, forget it, on, a, on our dead body. You are there now for three days. You have food in the closet, you have tefillin, you have a bathroom over there, you have no excuses. You cannot come out. <laughs> he begins to bang on the door, screaming, crying, don't do it to me, Elizabeth, it's not my fault. <laughs> three days, is, let's say, after, oh, you almost faint. Three days. After three days, they open the door. The wedding is over, Baruch Hashem. <laughs> he comes out. He's throwing fists all over. They put him down. Relax. We did it for your own favor. We, how can we let you destroy yourself? No, you cannot do it. Right away, call England. She picks up the phone. Please forgive me. This is, this is, this is what happened. 
She started to curse him on the phone, you dirty Jew. They told me, what am I doing with you? Oh, Hitler should have finished the job. She began to scream for 15 minutes. He couldn't make a beep. He hung up the phone. He turned around. He started to hug them. <laughs> now they really opened the champagne. <laughs> what would happen if their friends wouldn't care about him? He would be married to her. Ten years later, he'll find out that she's no another one. <sighs> this is what's happening. The Ramban writes on Sefer Shmot, the, nation, the, the girls of the nation of Israel brought to Moshe Rabbeinu the Miro. They had a Miro. They used to look at themselves and make themselves pretty for their husbands. Not for the grocery guy. It was in the desert. There was no goim there. It was only the Jewish nation. They come to Moshe, they gave him all the mirrors. And Moshe Rabbeinu didn't like that they gave their mirrors. Everyone donated whatever they can to build the Mishkan. HaKadosh Baruch Hu told him, Make the sink with that. Take this and make the sink. Why? When a woman drink, when a woman that they suspected her that she cheated on her husband, she has to drink from this water that the Kohen writes the name of Hashem, he puts it in the water, the ingos, it's called Amayim Amararim. She drinks it. If she cheated, her wound is exploding. If she didn't, the Kohen gives her the best bracha that all her children will be tzaddikim. That's how they used to do it. So, where is the water spilling as she drinks and they prepare everything in that sink? HaKadosh Baruch Hu say to Moshe Rabbeinu, don't feel bad about these mirrors. Why? It's a mitzvah for a Jewish woman to be pretty for her husband. It's no prostitution, it's fine. A woman can be with her husband, they can enjoy the intimate relationship, but they have to do it according to the laws of the Torah. That brings me to the number one reason for divorce in the Jewish world today. Number one divorce. Divorce cause, the reason. What is it? People do not keep taharat mishpacha. Some mitzvot has luck. It's a lucky mitzvah. Some mitzvot has no luck. No luck. It's, no, it's hard to explain. For instance, mezuzah. Mezuzah, it's mitzvah with luck. Almost every Jew put mezuzah. Even Jews who follow Christianity and all kinds of calls, somehow they have mezuzah in their door. Almost everyone. And the mitzvah has luck is Brit Mila. Jews who did not have take an eight days old baby and cut a part of his body. Out of nowhere, nobody understands how can it be. You just say that the Torah is not from Hashem. Based on what? You cut a part of your baby's body? I mean, you crazy? You, you just say that the book that says to do it, it's nonsense. So how do you do it? Nobody ever, almost every Jew does it, Brit Mila. But there is a mitzvah, like Taharat Mishpacha, it's mitzvah with no luck. Almost no secular Jews keep this mitzvah in the whole world. Maybe 1% of them knows what it is. The rest, nobody knows what it is. When yet a husband that is together with his wife without her going into the mikveh after a period, after she gets clean from all her blood, she doesn't go into natural water, spring water, rain water, etc. Being together with his own lovely wife is a worse sin than being together with his own mother. That's in the Torah, in Parashat Acharemot. We read it in Yom Kippur, in a mincha, in the most important hour of the year. Why? Mitzvah with no luck. Most Jews do not know what it is. You ask a secular uncle of yours, tell me, do you know what Tarat Mishpacha? Nobody knows. Mezuzah, everybody knows. Filin, almost everybody knows what it is. Brit Milah, almost everybody knows. Even Shabbat, everybody knows. Everyone heard about it. Tarat Mishpacha, 99 out of 100 do not know what you're talking about. What is this? Is from Judaism? I thought it's from China. I don't know what it is. And yet, it's in the top list of the most important and the most critical sins in the Torah. HaKadosh Baruch Hu say, I made nature. I made a man and I made a woman. 
and the body of a person is a combination, a person is a combination of body and soul. The body always wants physical desires, and the soul always wants spiritual pleasure. Putting them together, it's a battle. It's a battle because the, the pow, because, be, between the power of good and the power of bad. All your life it's a battle. If the spiritual side is winning, you are a tzaddik. If the materialism is winning, you are wicked. Now, everything physical that you enjoy, HaKadosh Baruch Hu made a rule in nature. The pleasure is temporary. It will not last one day, two days, and it's over. You bought a car, two or three weeks you're excited, and it's over. You bought a new watch, one month, you forgot about it. You met your wife, one month after, you're not so impressed from her beauty like you were a month ago. Why? You got used to it. That's the way the world is. No matter what, you build yourself a new mansion, six months you like it. After that, you begin to think, what am I doing in such a tiny apartment? Why? You got used to it. This is the way life is. You eat, you like, I don't know, ice cream, you like meat, you like whatever you like. If every day you eat it, you vomit. HaKadosh Baruch Hu say, my friend, I gave you your wife. She has to enjoy from you, you have to enjoy from her in a kosher way. What's the kosher way? On and off. On all the time, it's a distraction to your marriage. It won't last more than six months. Yeah, technically they can be married for 20 years, but the marriage really is over six months after the time of the wedding. Why? Because it's on all the time. HaKadosh Baruch Hu say, two weeks. Two weeks, I mean 12 days, 13 days, depend. You're not allowed. Then 17, 18 days, it's fine. 12 days off, 18 days on. 12 days off, 18 days on. Forever! 860! When she comes back from the mikveh, you like her like you met her 20 years ago, 30, 40 years ago. Same excitement. Without that, everything in life you get tired of. Doesn't matter how great she is, doesn't matter how great you are. A person also has to worry about his image. I know Sheker Achen, Hevel Ayofi, woman has to worry about her weight. She doesn't have permission to become 500 pounds. She doesn't have permission. The Torah says a person has to watch his health and watch his look. Why? If you want your marriage to be successful, especially in such a poor generation, how the woman expect that her husband will, would commit to 20, 30 years of relationship when she neglects herself, she eats whatever she wants, she doesn't care of her beauty, nothing, no makeup, nothing whatsoever. Of course he's going to cheat. What do you expect? I went to a very big grave, very holy man. I told him how you, the Ashkenazis, allowed your wife to wear such fancy wigs. Don't you know it's a very big sin? He told me, yeah, we know. But there is, the alternative is much worse. I said, what do you mean? He said, if we won't let them wear these wigs, 50% of the husband who right now are in the marriage will go and look somewhere else. Because the level of the people in this generation became so low, what can you do? It's better that it's going to be 50% more cheating? That's his answer to me. I couldn't make a beep. Thank you. I got your answer. That's his answer. I thought in the beginning it's a joke. Why? You see that man is attracted to his wife if she watch herself well. If not, it's becoming a problem. Same thing a husband. Who, has, who gave you permission to become a balloon? <laughs> ah, I'm a man, Rabbi, my wife doesn't care. She may not tell you, but she cares. Of course she cares. <laughs> yeah. The truth hurts, I know. A person has to watch. A person has to watch his health. A person has to do sport every week. You don't have time to do sport, walk to, walk to the synagogue every morning. Ten minutes walk, back and forth. Twenty minutes of walk, you keep your way down. You, do, you go with your children to the park Friday afternoon, an hour or two. You run, you do something. If it's kosher, if there's no girls over there, if the place is clean, yes. If not, a person has to worry about his health. Many people die because of their own lifestyle, not because Hashem wanted them to die. 45, heart attack, it's your fault. You come to Hashem, Hashem, why you took me so young? I didn't take you, you took yourself. Every day, three steaks, tons of cholesterol, what do you expect? 400 pounds, you are like this, 
you need two belts connected together. <laughs> now you're asking me why I took you. That didn't you read in the Torah, V'nishmartem lenafshotechem? Women has to be aesthetic. Women, they, you know, all these things that they have today, remove hair, this, that. A woman is even permitted to do plastic surgery to become prettier for her husband. And, yes, and even, and even for shiduchim. If a woman sees that she has problem in shiduchim, she has some kind of problem with her beauty that makes many guys don't take her on the shiduch, Rav Ovadia Yosef writes a long answer. She has permission to do a plastic surgery in her face to become prettier, to help her in her shiduchim, and it's a mitzvah. Why? This is the level of the generation. 2,000 years ago, not 2,000 years ago, 50 years ago, the Chazonish married his wife. He saw her two minutes before the chupa. And not only that, her husband was a wealthy man. He promised him a house, money for the rest of his life because he was the most important rabbi in the world. Biggest, big Talmud Chacham came from Russia to Israel. He told him, you never have to worry. All you do is learn Torah. Two weeks before the wedding, they found out it was all baloney. He tricked him. He didn't give him anything. And they told the Chazonish, how are you going to marry her? If all the conditions are not met by the other side. It's, a, it's deceiving. His answer was, yes. I have all the rights to annul the, the engagement. But how can I embarrass a Jewish girl? He married her not to break her heart. You understand? He met her in a wedding. That's it. Why? He was in a level. He didn't care who she is, how she look. If we were in that level, then you're right. Everything I say, you can put in the garbage. Since we're not in this level, people have to care about these things. Also, one more thing. A person has to make sure he always clean men and women, which means showers every day in the summertime or twice a day, depending how humid it is. Brushing the teeth, people have problems with their gums, they have to take care of it. And I'm telling you, no, your wife won't have the nerve to tell you that you stink. <laughs> you have to check yourself if you are like this or not. <laughs> yes! What are you laughing about? Don't you understand that this is adding to the problem? You know how many people get divorced because of aesthetic things? Chazal say a person should not have intimate relation with his wife during the day. Only at night. Because remember, in the old days there's no electric. Six, seven in the evening, it's all dark. What do you have? Little candles. You have few candles, you have a little bit light. You don't see anything. You just see an image. You don't see anything. Why? Because if it will be during the day, Shema Titgane Alav. He may see that she has pimples or things in her body that he didn't see because at night you don't see. And maybe he will get disgusted from her and that will affect the relationship. This was 2,000 years ago when these rabbis were holier than angels. And that was a factor. It's nevertheless today when people are close to zero. What do you, what do you surprise? That's why, now don't get the wrong impression, that women have no permission to be not modest. Nothing whatsoever. No permission to put perfume and walk in the street that every man who, who, who turns around to see where the smell comes from. No high heels. Not tons of makeup, not to open their hair. I'm talking single girls. You go on a shiduch, you're allowed in the first time to open up your hair that the men will see how you look. And that's it. After that, you don't have to make a show anymore. He already saw if you're pretty or not. If he wanted to date you second time, that means your beauty is fine by him. I'm not saying that the next date, you come and you do everything you can to look ugly. No. <laughs> but no more show off. You don't need to go 20 times to the bathroom. I'm sorry. Enough. You have to have some emunah in Hashem, not everything in your beauty. <laughs> Any questions before we finish? Yes. He can go to a kosher gym if there's no women there, or if there's separate hours for men and women. But once there are women in the same room, it's like going to the beach. Same scene. No difference. <laughs> a person see women sweating with not modest clothes two steps away from him, and he's not going to have thoughts about them. It's not realistic. Not permitted at all. And I'm not talking about the worst things that I heard. There's a sauna here, and some of you guys are going there sometimes to that sauna. 
just that you know the way to the sauna, every step towards there, take away your olam haba, even makes it further and further. Don't be surprised when you one day leave this world that the only reason that you have no share to the world to come is going to this place with the goyim, that they go into the bats. And there's so many problems. Are, Rabbi, but I keep Shabbat. Hashem will pay you for your mitzvot in this life. Why? When it comes to modesty, there's no discount. Remember, modesty comes before everything. Modesty comes before everything. Any more questions? Yes. If, yeah, if she asks if a woman is allowed to go to a man to do her hair, like, you know, haircuts and fix her hair, uh, the rule in Judaism is like this. When it comes to a profession, a person is busy with his profession, not necessarily has time to think about scenes, like doctor, gynecologist, even hairdressers, you know. But if you will be my daughter, I will do anything I can to prevent you from ever going to a man to touch you. Because in this generation, the people are so filthy that it's impossible, no matter how many women he touch a week, that he won't think about them dirty. It's impossible. And that's why we will have to say that it's not permitted. Because remember, when a doctor is busy with his job, he doesn't have time for sins. But today we hear more and more doctors are doing bad things to their patients. So we see that what were applied three, four hundred years ago doesn't apply today. People, you have to assume that they have a dirty mind, no matter what. And that's why a woman cannot be in a house when a painter comes to paint. Hey, he only has to do his job. No, no, he has other things in his mind. That's what's happening today. More questions. Now it's the time. Can you talk a little more about the Harat Mishpacha? You have anything specific you want to know or no? No, just a general. In general, the laws of Tarat Mishpacha, the Torah says that a person is not allowed to get close to a woman when she is in her period. Even though it takes five, six days for the blood to disappear, she has to keep seven clean days. This is days of doubt. Sometimes there is spots. So she has to keep seven more clean days, and then she goes into the mikveh at night after the arrival of the stars. Of course, before she goes into the mikveh, she brushes her hair, she cleans her ears, uh, under the, the nails, everything. Why? Because the entire body has to go in one shot into the pure water. Mikveh has nothing to do with, the, with, the, with cleaning the body. Nothing to do with clean. It, it's something spiritual. Therefore, if the mikveh looks like a chicken soup, <laughs> right? It's still, she still has to go in go into the mikveh because it removes the impurity of nature. Many of the women say, Rabbi, you know, the mikveh is so dirty. I can't, I can't. I mean, I mean uh, you know, I'm, I, I vomit when I see the mikveh. <laughs> but when she goes to Sheraton Hotel, she goes into the pool, there is 20 quarts of oil, tanning oil. Then 400 uh, courts, 400 liters of the children's bathrooms there. <laughs> no, the children, when they don't have a bathroom, the mother puts them in a pool. Come, come, honey, go inside. Then, then, I don't want to tell you what else inside the water. And she comes out of the water. Wow, beautiful. The mikveh is a million times cleaner. The kids don't come to do, you know, their business over there. <laughs> Plus, they clean it, they put chlorine, it kills the germs. What's the excuses? To go to the, to the swimming pool full of the dirt, there's no evil inclination that tells you don't go. To go into the mikveh, the satan is saying, look at this, it's not for you. Not for you. Why? The satan is interested that they live in a sin. You understand? Also, one more thing I forgot to say. When a person is having relationship with a woman before they got married, is almost guaranteed to finish with divorce. You should know because when a person makes sins against Hashem, Hashem pays him back. No mercy. No mercy whatsoever. Unless if they make tshuva before they got married. But to make tshuva doesn't mean only to regret that they had intimate relation. No. It's, that's a part of the tshuva. To regret, to feel horrible, to be ashamed, to ask Hashem to forgive, to fast on Yom Kippur. This is mandatory. It's obvious. Not enough. 
it I have to separate completely for, for X amount of time, four months, five months, six months, complete separation, and now start all fresh after they become Balei Tshuva. If they go into the wedding while they already live like a husband and wife until a week before the wedding, this wedding have a curse on it. Just a few days ago, someone showed me statistic. The, the, the divorce rate by people who live together is much higher than people who never live together. The, it's very unbelievable. You may think that the people who should have the highest divorce rate are the Hasidim. They meet each other for an hour, maximum two hours, they get married. What's the chance to stay married? It should have been one out of a hundred stayed married, 99 get divorced after three hours. That's what it should have been. Oh, I didn't know. Reality, they have the lowest divorce rate in the world. And the people who live together one year, two years, three years, right away after the marriage, they come to get divorced. They ask them in Israel, in the Rabbanut, what's the reason of the divorce? He stink. You live two years with him in the apartment, you didn't know that? Uh, he's stingy. Where were you in the last two years? You went 500 times to dinners. You didn't see he's stingy? Now you saw two months after you got married, he's violent. Where were you in the last two years? You didn't see that he's getting angry? The answer is, the Satan who's in charge of the evil inclination blinds a person when he makes a sin. He blinds him. It's called Maim Gnuvim Imtaku. Stolen and water are sweeter than natural water that you bought with your own money. The stolen water are delicious. Why? Because it's a sin. The sin is delicious. One, one father threw his son into the freezing water. And the son was freezing. And he took him out and he gave him a towel. So he told him, Abba, why did you do this to me? Such a freezing water. Wow. I froze. He told him, son, do you know what's the difference between uh, cold water to a sin? So the son is thinking, what's the connection now, cold water to a sin? So he told him, no, Abba, I don't know. So the father said, the sin, when you do the sin, first you say, ah, and then you say, oh. <laughs> Cold water, first you say, ah, oh no, first you say, ooh, then when you get the towel, you say, ah, that's the difference. With the sin, it's first, ah, then it's ooh for thousands of years. What do you think? There's no supervisor. There's an eye who watch over you. There's a he who listens to you, and everything you do has been registered in the book of God. That's what the Torah says. If you thought that reality changed just because your, 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 your seeds are delicious, you are dreaming. Hashem is watching everything. So the conclusion of this is, if a person lives in a sin, time to break it up. Not to stay in touch with the phone. That's bribery. You don't see the truth. Same thing in conversion. A man is dating a Goya. And now she really wants to convert, for real. What's the halacha? Must be a total separation for months. And he has to tell her, I'm not going to, the, to marry you after you convert. I'm telling you already. Why? Because if she has in mind, I'm converting that I want to marry this Yossi, the conversion is pasul. It's not for the sake of heaven. It's why? Because she wants him. If he would be Ahmed, she would become a Muslim. It's not for the truth. But if she converts anyway, she did it for the truth. Then there's some allowed to marry her. Some don't even allow this. They say, listen, I won't have any blessing. Marry this convert when you dated her and made sin with her. I want to tell you, you know, the Torah say, we'll finish with this. The Gemara brings a story of a man who fell in love with a girl in his neighborhood. He already violated one halacha. He didn't watch his eyes. This beautiful girl walked in the street. He looked at her, fell in love with her. Now he's in love. All day he's thinking about her. Nothing. His boss calling him, Avi, Avi, where are you? Oh, I'm sorry, I was thinking about something. All day is like this. Then he comes to the girl and he says to her, Excuse me, would you marry me? He said to her, Would you marry me? 
She said, marry you? No, I'm not interested. He came to his doctor. He said, doctor, I'm about to die. He said, what? He said, I'm in love with this girl. I cannot function anymore. So the doctor said, okay, well, let me ask the rabbi. Maybe it's pikuach nefesh. Maybe if it's a life risk. We'll see. Comes to the rabbis. Say, rabbis, this is the story. This person he has a broken heart. Something can happen to him. Tell us what's the halacha. What's the law? The rabbi say he should die and she won't agree to make a sin with him. That's his problem. He dies, he dies. No permission. The next day the doctor comes back to the rabbi. Okay, not to have a complete relation. Just that she walks in front of him. Every day, one minute. To relax his yeser ara. The answer of the chachamim, he should die and she, walk in, she won't walk in front of him. Let, let him die. It's pikuach nefesh. He should die. With modesty, there's no games. She will talk to him from two sides of the world. She will stand on one side and he would stand in the other side and they talk about the weather a little bit. The answer of the that's what we call today phone call. Rabbi, I don't talk, I don't walk with any guy, but I have friends, I talk to them on the phone a little bit. That's what it is. To start without seeing each other. The psak of the Chachamim, he should die, she won't agree to talk to him one minute. Why? What does he have in his mind when he talks to her? The weather? <laughs> Cares about the weather? This is Alcha. A Jew will die, you can save his life by letting, him, letting her speak to him once or twice a week about the weather, about the last war. You see how David Amelech won the war? What a hero. Who cares about this? He doesn't care about this. He cares about her. Let him die and she won't speak to him on the phone. Now, in our generation, phones, email, Facebook, pictures, dating, sitting in a park together. Shomer Shabbat, Rabbi. And then they wonder why almost everyone get divorced. If you want your marriage to be successful, you have to invest in it now. Not when you meet the girl, now. Because according to who you are, that's how your shiduch is going to be. If you're going to be holy, you work on your character, on your personality, when the time for you come to get married, Hashem will bring you a girl from your league. As the Gemara say, Amarish Lakish mezavgim lo laadam zivug lefi maasav. If you are a sav, they'll bring you a savit. That's what's going to be. You understand? If you are filthy, all you care about is Miami, vacations, Cancun, this, that, jet ski, all this nonsense. But it's Shomer Shabbat. No jet ski on Shabbat, Rabbi. What's wrong with vacation? What's the problem, Rabbi, if Chol Moed of Pesach we sit with a million naked women on the beach of Miami? What's the problem? And sometimes the children will also see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they force the maid also, the, 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 not the maid, the, the, the babysitter. She's also a religious girl from a, a religious neighborhood. But she has to work with the family. It's her job. Let's go buy you a bathing suit. I had a girl like this come to cry to me what to do, if to quit or not. So I told her, the fact that you're already asking, it's already a problem. A kosher girl has to ask the rabbi if they want to take her to some beach in Puerto Rico with all the naked, filthy people on the beach to make Hashem so angry and she's asking if she allowed to wear bathing suit on the beach? For money? Where did we get? Take our grandmothers, give them a million dollars, our grandmother. Tell her here, take a million dollars, walk with a bathing suit one hour on the beach. How many women will agree to do it? How? Nobody. I, I remember my grandmother. Every second she made sure that her hair will be under her thing. Every second! She just finished, she check again. She was eight years old. Who cares if she has some white hair comes out? It's already in the jeans. In the jeans. Why? They couldn't imagine life being not modest. It's not, a, it's not even an option. And today, wow, what's going on out there? It's scary. So, 
the choice is 100% yours. You want to see your life going to the right direction, you want to have blessing in your marriage, you want to have great life, you have to start working on it now. The more you talk to people, socialize, go not into non-modest places, you're going to see the results later on. It's putting the seeds in the ground and not taking care of them. But if you take care of the seeds in the right way, then later you're going to see a beautiful tree. Don't come to cry 20 years from now why your son is a murderer, or why he's a rapist, or why he married a Goya. It's today. It's today what you do on Facebook or in the internet, on the dirty website that you're going in, the price will come in 20 years from now, and you don't see the connection. You don't see the connection. There was a famous trial in Israel. A famous trial in Israel. A 20 years old boy ran on the street, and he saw an old woman, 80 years old, walk in the street, and she has a gold necklace. He pulled the necklace, he tried to rub her, but the necklace was thick. He was expecting that the necklace would rip, and he ran away, but it didn't rip. Instead, he pulled her to the ground. She fell on the ground and died. People ran after him, they put him down, the police came, they arrested him, two months later, there's the trial. The mother of the murderer is sitting in a crowd. The judge is reading the name of the woman who died. The, st the state of Israel against the murderer such and such that murdered this woman on that date. The mother of the murderer screamed and fainted in the middle of the court. They bring water, they wake her up. After a few minutes, the judge asks her, ma'am, why did you scream? We didn't even start the trial yet. What, what, what did I say that you didn't know yet? You didn't know that we blaming your son for murder? She said, no, the name of the woman that he murdered, that's what made me faint. So the judge said, why, you knew her? She said, can I tell you how I know her? He said, yes, go ahead. She said, 20 years ago, it was Friday afternoon. I was baking, I was cleaning the house an hour before Shabbat. My husband and I are religious people. My husband is a person with anger and temper. Every 10 minutes he asks me, No, go to the mikveh before Shabbat starts. Go. And I told him, Yeah, yeah, five more minutes I go. I say, Well, they closed the mikveh. Go, 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 go. I say, Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. By the time I arrived to the mikveh, the woman, the balanit, was locking the door. I told her, please let me in. She said, oh, it's another now half an hour. What? I have to go prepare Shabbat myself. He, she said, no, my husband's going to get angry at me. Please, you have to save me. She said, you had to think about it before. I also have life. Come back, Motsai Shabbat. What's going to be? Your husband wait another night. She told her, no, you know, you don't understand. You don't know who my husband is. She says, woman, I'm sorry. Let me go. She locked the place and she left. That night, she came back home, her husband, the angry wolf, he comes to her and says, No, you went to the mikveh? She says, Yes, tavalti. What is she going to do? She had two choices, to say this or to be dead. <laughs> <laughs> That's reality. So, that night, she became pregnant. Twenty years later, the boy that was born from that intimate night walked on the street and saw an old woman with a gold necklace. He ran to her, he grabbed the necklace, she fell and died. Who was the woman? The balanit of the mikveh. The boy that was born that night from her, not letting her go into the mikveh, even though she had a case. Just if she had the Rat Shamaim, she said, you know what, what, do, what can I do? I have to let her in, I have no choice. If she describes her husband like such a monster, I, can, I, I have to save her. What happened? The murderer was the boy that was born that night. Everything is supervised. That's why she fainted in a court. That's a famous story in Israel. In a court, in a secular court. Even the judge almost fainted. <laughs> Yes, why? Everything is supervised. Please don't make scenes now before you get married. I know it's easy to be, it's, I know it's difficult to be single. I know there's a lot of tests out there, but you have to prevent the tests away from you. 
enough with the internet, enough with access to the computer, enough with all kinds of stupid radio shows or television shows. Clean your life. It's hard, but it's worth it. In the end, when you see 500 couples around, you get divorced and you see you have a wonderful life. You, thinking to, you'll, you will understand that Hashem is paying you back for, for one or two years of efforts. You don't want to do it the way of Hashem. Everybody pays in the end. Nobody runs away from it. It's reality. Eating poison kills. It's reality. Now I hope, Bezrat Hashem, that you remember what I said here in the name of the Torah. You want to be successful in your marriage, first thing, as the Chafetz Chaim say, you work on your character. Anger, ego, stinginess. All these things, put yourself down. One rabbi, his wife was making him tea every day. One day he left a little bit from the tea and ran to yeshiva. She said, oh, let me finish it. She came, she drank it, she almost fainted. It turns that for six months she put in salt in his tea. And he never made a beat, not to upset her. You understand? <laughs> Rav Simcha Levin, two generations ago in Israel, he went to the doctor with his wife. She had pain in her leg. He said to the doctor, doctor, our leg hurts. My wife's legs hurts, I feel the pain. Like two twins, one here, one there, they feel the pain of each other. They connected. If you don't have this kind of connection with your wife, what do you expect? To become a husband, you have to learn a lot. Psychology of the woman, depression before giving birth, depression after giving birth, <laughs> attention, compliments, 500 compliments a week minimum you have to give her. <laughs> wow, your, your, your food is the greatest. My mother has to come take a course by you. <laughs> Today it's the opposite. You have to go to my mother to see how she makes a savo. <laughs> oh, Gondi, you don't know how to do. <laughs> Uh, you see how they need attention? <laughs> uh, that's it. What do you care? It costs you money. Even the cheap things that, that it's easy to do, nobody wants to do. Give her a flower with words of love is better than a new Lexis, I promise you. <laughs> better. Show her you care about her. Write her nice things. Call her from work while you're taking haircuts. Uh, darling, I, I call you to say I love you. Oh, we just spoke to me an hour ago. So what's the problem? I can't tell you twice a day that I love you. <laughs> Today, she drives me crazy. She doesn't understand I'm busy. Every hour she calls me. <laughs> if that's the point in your marriage, that means something is not working. She doesn't feel loved. You never argue with her in front of the kids. Never disrespect her in front of the kids because the kids will be like this to their own wives. If you abuse her, your kids become like you because that's the no, no other way. A woman has to respect her husband, even if he's wrong. Later, she talks to him, not in front of the kids. And never, ever let your parents or your in-laws know anything from what happened in your life. Never. Your husband did this to you, never make that mistake. After two, three times, your parents will target him as their enemy. And even if you make peace, and now he made Shuvah and he's a wonderful husband, it's not going to work anymore. They're going to start dripping into your brain. Get rid of him. Come to us. Bring the kid and come home. They're going to ruin the marriage. They mean well, but you caused it. They come, they check in your closet. They do all kinds of things. Why? Because they're already in their mind, my daughter, I gave her to this guy, and he disrespect her, or he hit her. To hit a woman? Who heard such a thing? A man, he hits his wife. How can it be such? First of all, what a low life. What a loser. What a loser that he has to beat a woman. For, hard to believe that we have people in our generation. I'm not talking secular people from the zoo. I'm talking people that comes to synagogue six, seven in the morning, talit and filin, khatati, aviti, two hours later he smacked his wife. For what? She forgot to pay a bill or something. Or she wanted a little bit of attention. Or she got a ticket. Where is your religion? Where is your religion? What, is all fake? How can it be a person touch his wife? How can it be such a thing? It's hard to believe that a person can go so low and he doesn't realize that he's a monster and he thinks he's a tzaddik. 
Rabbi, I have my reasons. He has the nerve to justify his acts. Believe me, I have my reason. You'll be one day in my house, you understand why I'm doing it. Can you believe such a thing? Maybe he saw his father doing it, and his father learned it in some Muslim country where he lived, when the women has no value, they garbage on the floor. And he thinks that that's the right way. No, no, that's not the right way. D didn't I read to you what the Torah say? To love her and respect her more or like his body. You hit yourself? If you hit yourself, you, you belong in a barbanel, in a mental institution. <laughs> you don't hit yourself, you cannot hit your wife. And that's what it is. I'm sorry that I even have to bring such things. But remember, compliments, compliments, never make comments, never bring down her confidence. And if your wife gain weight, make sure you never make that mistake and tell her to her. Because that will be the end of your relationship. In this building, a few years ago, a person came to me and said, Rabbi, I think my wife is cheating on me. I told him, what makes you think so? He said, well, you know, since we got married, we were mamash like magnets. All of a sudden, two, three months, she's avoiding me all the time. I, I checked her computer, I checked the phone, I checked everything, nothing. No signs of cheating. But I'm sure that that's what she does. So I told him, allow me to ask you a question. Did you recently tell your wife, since the, you described the problem started two, three months ago, that she gained weight? He said, yeah, yeah, she did gain weight. <laughs> told him, oh, now I understand why she doesn't want to be near you. You, lo you took away all her confidence. She doesn't want to be near you. She's always going to tell you, headache, I don't feel good, I vomit, my back hurts. Excuses. Why? She, her life was that you like her, you like her beauty, you like the way she look. All of a sudden you told her about the things that is the most important in her life, you lost it. You're worthless. What I met, it's not what I have. Of course she doesn't, she doesn't want to leave now. Forget about marriage. That's some mistake it takes 20 years to correct. Hundreds of times you will have to tell her that she lost weight, she looks great. Wow, what an imp improvement. It won't work. One stupid comments, now 20 years you have to work in saving your marriage and your personal relationship between you and your wife. How ignorance can ruin life. That's what happens when you don't learn. So remember, before you go into the wedding, there's a lot to learn. I always say, if I had the money and the time, I would open a college for relationship to teach men and women preparation for wedding six months before the date. And I promise you, the divorce rate will go by thousands of percent. There's no time and no money. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time.